Dear Father, we thank you for this time we can preview the lesson. We thank thee for what we've been covering this quarter about the, the experience of the early church in Acts. And now as we go into the ministry of Peter, as a segue to the ministry of Paul and the later lessons, may we have a good foundation of what it meant for you to carry someone who was restored, reinstated by Jesus Christ to make a very big difference for the church. And through his example, may we learn that uh, there is no one here that, can, that is beyond your grace. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so the study is about the ministry of Peter. And I think a very good, a good outline of the way we should look into the lesson is that if you were to go to the book of Acts, somebody put this really nicely. It is really divided into the Acts of Peter and the Acts of Paul, right? Those are two major personalities in the early church, the primitive church, the Christian church. Uh, and the first accounts that we read about are the accounts of what Peter did. And you know, as we studied today, you go to the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, and then he becomes Paul. By the way, why, why, what is the difference between Saul and Paul? Did you guys process that? Okay. So there's this, is the Aramaic name. And there's really, there's people that have been saying that Paul is the conversion name of Saul. There's really no connection. Saul is a Hebrew name, okay? And Paul is a Roman and a Greek, a Hellenistic name for him. And remember, Paul had dual citizenship. And he was a Jew. At the same time, he was also a Roman, if you read in Acts. That's the reason why he appealed to Rome. He got to Rome because they were trying him and he appealed to Caesar. Um, so there's, there's two ways to have citizenship, Jus Solis and Jus Sanguinis, right? Jus Sanguinis is for Jus uh, for blood, uh, and then Jus Solis is by, by pedigree, okay, by parents. So if your parents are Filipinos and you're born in America, by parentage, you, are, you can elect to be a Filipino citizen, okay? But if you were born in America, you can also elect to be an American citizen. Is it by blood or is it by birth? Okay, that's the whole issue. But for Paul, Paul was both a Jewish and a Roman citizen. Um, anyways, we will cover more of Paul uh, starting next week. We'll talk about the missionary journeys of Paul and what he did. But right now, suffice it to look at uh, Peter. Uh, who was Peter? One of the, the three closest disciples to Jesus. And what is Peter most famous for in Acts? Giving a miracle of beginning to walk. Okay, the, the, the lame is the, but, but really, if you were to look at the, the beginnings of the church, what occasion uh, do you remember Peter by? His sermon. Yes. And the sermon was a sermon in, on Pentecost, the day of Pentecost. And what happened after the sermon? 3,000 people were baptized. You, you don't know, you don't know the, the, the magnitude of that, okay? So I just came from the Philippines. The first weekend for these Philippines for Christ was about close to 600 baptism uh, by the, the uh, a reaping campaign by the Pastor John Brots. So I think that hundreds more the following weekend. Okay, those, those were only 600. This was 3,000. Okay, remember during the time of Peter, they did not have a Philam church, and they didn't have Hinsdale church, and Elmer's church. They were just gathering in homes. Okay, but Peter was able to lead 3,000 people to Christ. Well, something interesting too. Out of the 3,000, what kind of nationalities do you have? If you look at Acts, there's, about, there's at least 15 countries represented there. That's why, how did they understand? Well, they call it glossolalia, speaking in tongues. Peter was able to speak in different languages and he was understood. Okay? So, the birth of the church was actually... Because of Peter's ministry, can the Lord graciously pick uh, uh, Peter? So let, 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 let's summarize this really qu quickly. Um, you see Paul in Acts, the persecutor is saved, Paul instructed. 
you begin with Jerusalem and then you go to Judea and Samaria. Okay, then you start with Peter establishing the church in Jerusalem, and then the church is scattered because of of Roman persecution. And then uh, you know we talk about Barnabas and Paul, Philip and Peter uh, being used by God in the early spread of the gospel. And of course, uh, Paul goes to the Gentiles and give the gospel to the Gentiles. That's why, what would say in Jerusalem, and then in Judea, Judea and Samaria, and then into the uttermost parts of the world. So if you look at this, uh, I'll upload this so you can you can just download this from the site. Uh, this will be give you a good outline of what the chronology is for the early church. Okay, let's look at St. Peter very quickly for his personality and his character. Okay, we know that Peter is very impulsive and yet he is cowardly. Right? Those are the texts. Uh, he is also hot-tempered and yet he is tender-hearted. Let, let's read some of the texts here. So, You'll have an appreciation. Somebody read John 18.10. And if someone has uh, Matthew 26.75, we read it. Somebody read John 18.10. Anyone? Then Simon Peter's hairy sword drew it and struck the high priest servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Marcus. <laughs> so you know what happened, right? He they arrested Jesus and Peter said, over my dead body, nobody can touch you. He grabs a sword and struck off the ear of Malchus. Okay? And about Matthew 26, 75. Matthew 26, 75. And you guys are still going to your hard copies or going to your book. 2675, you have the boy? 2675. Then Peter remembered the word of Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crowds, you will disown me three times. Alright, so this 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 man cutting off Marcus's ear. Very impulsive, hot tempered, okay? At the same token, when he realized he has denied his Lord, the tenderheartedness of he started weeping because of what he has done. So you see this contrast in the personality and character. And you know what happened in Matthew 16, right? The Matthew 16, the question of Jesus, who do men say that I am? And Peter says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. He was insightful. And in the end, <laughs> Peter said, because Jesus said, you know, I'll be taken to... Uh, by the authorities and I'm going to suffer and what did Peter say Lord that will never happen to you and then what did uh, Jesus say get thee behind me say that okay one point is insightful the other point is ignorant right so he was a uh, bipolar <laughs> no not really bipolar it happens to us now we, have, we don't have the same moods he just have several moods I don't think he was out of his mind but he, that's the character of an impulsive disciple he was courageous in Pentecost, and you know what happened, right? When he was eating with the Gentiles, Paul corrected him. He was hypocritical. So, what can we say about this? Peter was a human being. <laughs> That's what we're trying to say. It's not like a god or an angel. He's like us. And the very consoling thing about this is he's one of the chief leaders of the church. You know what I'm saying? He's not just an ordinary member. Not that there are you know, levels, but... The fact that he's the leader, the main one, the main leader in the church, but he had this challenges in his personality and character. It's that uh, you're not beyond God's grace. God's grace can still mold us and use us the way he wants us to be used. Paul was a little pushy or demanding, or he was demanding in his, when he was the leader of the church with that personality. Are you being Peter or Paul? Um, Peter. No, I don't think so. We will learn that. That Peter learned humility when he was reinstated by Jesus, and he was really a shepherd. Remember during the the confrontation, love is. Do you love me more than this? That was the question. And what was the answer of Jesus then? Feed my sheep, feed my lamb. So basically, take care of my flock. Be a pastor. What that's what Jesus was trying to say. And we will learn that Peter had the pastor's heart. So he was 
he was not jockeying for a position. In fact, he gave way for James to be the big honcho, right? And then in terms of Paul, Paul didn't care about position. <laughs> he goes, he said, go to Jerusalem. I only saw these people. I don't know who occupies positions there. All I care about is they preach the gospel. That's what Paul, okay, Paul is about, right? So, there are significant events in Peter's lives, okay? Uh, first, he was, Jesus called him to be a fisher of men after the miracle of catching the fish in a long night, you know, casting the nets. Remember, he was walking on water. Remember, he walked on water after the feeding of the multitude. Jesus walks in water. And remember how, I will not forget that. I have a sermon on this. But Peter didn't tell Jesus, Lord, I want to walk on water too. He didn't say that. What did Peter say? Lord, if that's you, bid me come to you. So he will not walk until Christ bids him. Because Christ, uh, he... He was bid by, by Jesus Christ. He was able to walk on water. And you know what happened? He saw the winds and Jesus, Jesus uh, saved him. And then he also saw the transfiguration. Remember, uh, Jesus was saying, a lot, of, a lot of people here will not taste death and they see the coming of the kingdom. Actually, Jesus was referring to the transfiguration in Mount Tabor. Uh, because uh, it was on the Mount Transfiguration that Jesus assumed his glory like the brightness of the sun. You know? He was also with Jesus in Gethsemane. You have several impulsive actions. He denied Jesus three times. He was not only forgiven, but commissioned to feed or to be a pastor of the church. And after Pentecost, Peter becomes a bold preacher, preaching at hundreds at a time and leader who no longer feared death. You know how Peter died, right? He was crucified upside down according to tradition. We don't read it in the Bible. But most uh, commentators and historians say that he was... Okay, so here is the outline I'll use if I were to teach this this coming Sabbath. Let's go to Mark 14. And we'll look at the mistakes of Peter. Uh, number one, so if somebody can read uh, Mark 14, 27 to 31. But yes, it. Mark fourteen twenty seven thirty one. And Jesus said unto them, All ye shall be offended, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered abroad. Call to after I am raised up, I will go before you into Galilee. But Peter said unto him, Although all shall be offended, yet will not I. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that thou today, even this night, before the cup called twice, shall be not with Christ. Okay. 31. Yeah. But he spake exceedingly vehemently, If I must die with thee, I will not be minded. And in like manner also she said they all. Thank you. So Jesus is saying, the time is coming, the time is about to come. I'll be arrested, I'll be taken to suffer and die for you. What did Peter say? Even though they all fall away, I will not. Here's the first problem of Peter. He boasted too much. Foot and mouth disease. That's what they say, Lord, anything is saying. Peter was a disciple who, before he speaks, he puts two feet in his mouth, and then he attempts to walk. It's very difficult to walk when two of your feet is in your mouth. But basically, he's saying, Peter is so impulsive, he think we can do this, you know, overconfidence. He boasted too much, all right? So we go to, we, I will just skip some of the 32 to 42. Because he boasted too much, he prayed too little. Uh, this is very gripping when I was reading this account. Um, you know the struggle Jesus had to go through in Gethsemane? You know, it, 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 was, it was so heavy of a struggle that he pleaded that his friends pray for him. This is the Son of God. You know what I'm trying to say? Because he knows that he's going to be... Uh, what was the cry of Jesus? Let this cup pass from me because... To imagine that I will be separated from the Father, it's just 
it's just beyond me. You know, it, it will be too much to bear. But so he said, because this is so much of a burden, this is a freight I can bear. I want my friends to pray for me. Um, I always say this. I mean, in, uh, during my camp meeting uh, messages in New Jersey last week, I, I told the brethren there, you know, we should learn to pray for each other more. That's the strength of the church. Because even if you don't have a lot of resources, if you pray a lot and you pray for each other, power is going to come, right? But the problem is if you boast too much, if you are confident, you depend on yourself too much, you will pray too little. You will, not, in fact, you will not pray at all. So that, so that's what happened. To, and then, if you go to verses forty-three to fifty, you know what happened, right? Uh, Judas comes. Judas kisses uh, Jesus during the arrest. Then we already talk about this. Peter grabs his sword and cuts off the ear of Malchus. And that's why this is where Howard Hendricks said, God has a tremendous sense of humor. Okay? You follow this. Um, you know why Judas is alive? I'll, I'll review this. Okay? So you'll have an idea. During the Last Supper, okay? You remember that the, the communion service that they had during the last supper jesus said one of you will betray me right and everybody said lord is it i is it i is it i right it passed along there's only one disciple who asked a different question everybody else asked is it i what did john ask who is it okay because john knew in his heart of heart he cannot he cannot betray or deny jesus christ so, what did Jesus answer? What, what was Jesus answer to John? The guy who dips the bread you know, into the cup. You know, if Peter heard that, Judas would have not come out of that room alive. You know why? Because he had the sword. And if he learned that Judas would be betraying Jesus Christ, Peter will kill Judas right there and then. He didn't care. He was the chief hunter of the disciples. So, if you, if you look at the passage, Really, when Jesus told it to John, he was actually whispering it to John. It wasn't heard by the rest of the disciples. Okay? So the fact is, Peter already had the sword with him during the Last Supper before they went to Gethsemane. Otherwise, you know, where did he get? And then here's the point. Peter was a fisherman. Okay? <laughs> he had two disadvantages going with him. Number one, he's a fisherman. He is not a swordsman. And to, de <laughs> to depend on a fisherman to be a soldier, yeah, it's not the best combination. More than that, Peter was mad, raging mad. You know, when you're in a fight and you're mad, you normally lose, right? That's why, that's what people appreciate with Pacquiao. <laughs> Pacquiao is very cool-headed. He never gets, you know, if it's a mental game, Pacquiao is ahead of the opponent. Yeah, so he had two disadvantages. But this is what he did. Well, I'm going to be part of the kingdom of Jesus Christ, so... I'm pretty sure one of these days we're going to go against the Romans. We better train myself into the art of combat. If Jesus is doing it, I'll just take the initiative. So what does he do? Uh, according to commentators, the Roman soldiers practice this every day. They go up the top of the hill, and then right down the hill is a helmet. Right? And the helmet is like glued in the center. You know, it's just a helmet. What the Roman soldiers do is they climb up the hill with the sword, they run down the hill. And as soon as they hit that helmet, they try to strike it with the sword right in the middle. And if you're able to split that helmet into two, strike it in the middle, you're a good soldier. And Peter watches this every day. He said, that's good. Go my court, my sword, hit it. This was what Peter was attempting to do in the Garden of Gethsemane. Malchus shows up. They arrest Jesus Christ. There he comes, says Peter. He goes, gets his sword, and attempts to strike at Malchus. There's only one problem. He was off target. <laughs> because if he was on target, Malchus could have been dead. He split his skull. But he was a fisherman, and he was not a soldier. So what did he hit? Yeah. <laughs> he hit, yes. hit the ear. <laughs> what did Jesus do? 
He just picks up the air, puts the air back. <laughs> and, 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 and Jesus is telling Peter, don't you put away your sword, you know? Don't you know that I can summon what? Legions of angels. Don't tell me, and we talk about that during my sermon today. Uh, how, how, how powerful is an, an angel? One angel, 185,000 this year, it's dead. Then you're talking 12 legions of angels, 12 times 6,000. I ain't got to wipe out of these guys. But Jesus wasn't there to defend himself. He was there to offer his sacrifice. Friends. So the problem was he acted too soon. He didn't think first. And he acted too soon. The fact that he acted too soon messed everything up. And of course, Jesus fixes it for you. And the fourth problem of Peter was thinking too little too late. Remember the story, right? He goes to the bonfire. The damsel goes, Oh, you surely you're one of them. I'll say it in Tagalog. Alay! In the Sama, Alay! When you say Alay, that's the accent of a Batangueño. And then somebody say, You're a Batangueño. Alay! Hindi ako Batangueño! You're like, you're, you're like, you're like uh, you're, you're you're just catching yourself because because if you give you give yourself away if you get the accent that was that they, they caught Peter at his accent and then what did he do? He started cursing. He that he cursed. In fact, the Bible doesn't record what he said because they were cursing. What happened? Cock crowed again. For the cock crows twice. Too little, too late. And one of the most tenderest records in the gospel it said, after Peter said, No, I do not know the men the third time, the eyes of Peter caught the eyes of Jesus Christ. Probably one of the worst things that you can ever commit is to deny Jesus Christ. So, he thought too little and too late. Okay. Now, before we go to what happened to Peter after Jesus reinstated him, We'll just go through some All right Here's a, a short summary of the escapades of Peter Look at the dotted lines Peter travels the Judean countryside and raises Aeneas in Lida Okay uh, So from Judea he went to Lida uh, There was a paralytic in 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 Lida, the name was Aeneas. He studied here quarterly, uh, bedridden for about seven, eight years. And Peter basically just attended to him and he healed Aeneas. Okay? Then he moved towards Joppa. And in Joppa, he encounters Dorcas. Who's Dorcas? That's why we have a Dorcas society. It was a woman who cared for those who are in need, he ministered to people in church. And Dorcas died. And Peter revived Dorcas. She came back to life. Uh, this guy, so he was not an ordinary man. He was healing and he was raising the dead in the name of Jesus Christ. All right? And then, of course, after that, he went to Caesarea. And then if you follow his tracks, he went all the way to Rome. Okay? Which takes us to this. So he went to Lida and Joppa and Caesarea here. Then afterwards eventually went to Antioch after he went to Antioch he proceeded to Ephesus and after proceeding to Ephesus he went to Corinth why do we know that he went to Corinth in Acts in Corinthians they were debating who they should believe should it be Apollos should it be Peter or Cephas or should it be Paul so the fact that people were debating whether they should follow Peter or not suggests that Peter was in Corinth he went to Corinth and after Corinth, he went all the way to Rome. He got to Rome. James was beheaded. And then shortly after that, about a year after that, Peter was crucified upside down. That was the story of Peter. All right? Now let's see how this unfolds in terms of... Oops. I will read these verses so you understand this. Whereas Peter had mistakes before, where he boasted too much, 
something changed in his life. What changed in his life? John 21, 15 to 17. You know what happened, right? B basically, Jesus said, uh, Do you love me? Do you love me? Simon, uh, let's, let's set it up first. Uh, Peter and the disciples, despite, despite of seeing Jesus Christ, they went back to fishing, right? You go to John 21. When they went back to fishing, they couldn't catch any fish. You know what happened, right? They eventually threw the net on the other side of the boat because Jesus told them to do that. And when they threw it, they caught a lot of fish. In fact, to be exact, there were 153 fish that they caught. And they hauled them to shore. When they got to shore, who was waiting for them? Jesus. What did Jesus have for them when they got to shore? Broiled fish. Yeah, he had broiled fish. What else? Well, he's got, he's got enough food for the... He's got bread and fish for the disciples. You guys, <laughs> I want to open up again the warm. Um, there is, in MVC, they made the slideshow to promote vegetarianism. <laughs> it's a, it's a thing. They, made, they made a slide of heaven with uh, chicken. <laughs> chicken and beef. It's a satire, let's say. But there will be no chicken and beef in heaven. That's why you better be vegetarians now, okay? So I said, and then somebody puts fish there. Okay. I mean, no fish in heaven to eat, not this fish to eat. Man. There's no fish in heaven to eat. And then somebody said, hey, you realize the resurrected Christ ate fish? <laughs> you are John 21, right? This is not Christ before the resurrection. This is the glorified body of Jesus. And he was eating fish. Anyways, what am I trying to say? I'm not saying vegetarianism is wrong. Oh, it's fanatical. In fact, I'm, I prefer eating vegetables to meat. That's probably why I was able to survive my episode. Okay? But, vegetarianism cannot save you. You know what I'm trying to say? And then you make that a criterion for your Christian life, you'll have problems. Okay? But what happened? Instead of boasting too much, he learned to be humbled before Jesus Christ. Because Jesus said, do you love me? How many times did Peter deny Jesus? Three times. How many times did Jesus ask Peter, do you love me? Three times. How many times did, did Jesus say, be a pastor to the flock? Three times as well. So even if you failed, Jesus will find a way to reinstate you. In fact, he will find you where you failed and pick you up where you failed. If you're willing to follow him. So that took away the pride, that took away the pride of Peter. What happened in Acts 9.32? Somebody read Acts 9.32. Okay, what was what was Peter doing there, Cleo? What, what does it say? Um, should I, um, he, he came to pass. Peter went through all parts. He came down also to the saints that were at Lida. And then he found a man named Elias who had kept his bed eight years for he was palsy. And Peter said to him, and he was Jesus Christ, see that day, arise and take thy bed. Okay, so we, we talked about that Agnes was healed. But look at verse 13. Let's look at it very closely. Now as Peter went here and there among, how many? Among them all. That's very important. You know why? Because Peter did not only pick the leaders of the church. He ministered to everybody in church. He visited the members of the flock. In other words, he was pastoring the flock in obedience to what Jesus said. So he was a very humble man. He's not saying, I'm too good to visit you. I don't care who you are. You can be a paralytic for eight years. I will visit you. In fact, God gives me the power. I'm going to heal you. So the, the mistake of boasting too much was gone with this encounter with Jesus. He was a humble pastor of the flock. All right? Second, Acts 9.40. The 
through their feet bent all forth and kneeled down and prayed. And turning to the body said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. All right. Peter did not go and say, Aha! Just ro rise up. What did he do first? He knelt down and prayed. Okay? The guy who prayed too little before knows that before he does anything for Jesus, he needs to pray. Acts 10 9. This is now the encounter with Cornelius. Now on the morrow, as they were on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the house of the prayer about the sixth hour. Uh -huh. So he was, staying in, he was staying in the house. What did Peter do? He went to the rooftop. Oh, he had a devotional life. He started praying as well. And you know what the story is about Acts 10, right? Then he saw the vision about the clean and unclean animals. He eventually goes to Cornelius and breaks the ground. It's sending the gospel to the Gentiles. So this is very important that before even Paul went into the Gentiles, Peter had already a foretaste of sending the gospel to the non-Jews or to the Gentiles. But it was a product of a prayerful life. He did not pray too little anymore. Prayer was a part of Peter's life. All right? Now let's go to Acts 12, 1 to 4. The king put forth his hands to afflict certain of the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also, and those were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had taken him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quarter millions of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him forth to the people. Huh. It is. The same Peter who retaliates right away with the sword, didn't retaliate anymore. In fact, this is really funny. How many soldiers were assigned to Peter? Soldiers? Yeah. Four squads. Four squads. Okay. A squad is about four soldiers. Sixteen soldiers. Isn't that a little too much for, for one disciple? Yeah, he was an arm. But despite that, Peter did not act too soon anymore. He was willing to be in prison for Jesus Christ. Right? He didn't use the sword anymore. And you know the story, right? I'm just an aside to so you. Know. Uh, and the, the church started praying for Peter, right? Then when the church started praying for Peter, God sends an angel. Yeah, breaks the prison doors, breaks the chains and the shackles, and sends Peter on the road. And the church was playing, they were in a prayer meeting for Peter to be freed from prison. Who was the girl assigned to open the door? Name was Rhoda. And then Peter knocks on the door. <laughs> they guys were praying and they didn't open the door <laughs> for Peter to be freed. And then they wouldn't believe it. In fact, God, God already said, funny, we pray for miracles and when God does a miracle, we don't believe it. But that's what happened. But Peter didn't act too soon anymore. He would not be in that house unless the angel instructed him to go there. But he did not withstand, he did not retaliate when he was arrested by the guards. But listen to the direction of God. Okay? And then lastly, Acts 15. Question, Peter rose up and said to them, Brethren, you know that a good while ago God made choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knoweth the heart, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Spirit even as he did unto us. And he made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why make ye trial of God that ye should put a yoke upon the necks of the disciples? which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. But we believe that we shall be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in like manner as they. All right. So, look at verse 7. And after there had been much debate. You hear that? So what was going on in here? There was a council in Jerusalem. And there's the biggest issue during the council was not women's ordination. Okay. That's for the jail conference today. 
the biggest issue was, should we preach the gospel to the Gentiles? That was the answer. This, will God also save the Gentiles or just the Jews? For, for them, they thought the kingdom was only for the Jews. And there was much debate. And of course, Peter was part of the debate. How do we know he's part of the debate? Because he finally became the spokesman at the end of the debate. And what did Peter say? Do not give an unnecessary yoke of bondage to the Gentiles. Because as God saves the Jews, he also saves the Gentiles. How, how does Peter prove that? Who was the, the prominent Gentile that came to faith because of Peter? Acts 10? Cornelius. Cornelius was converted to the faith, to the Christian faith. He and his household, because Peter ministered to them. All right? So Peter goes, and during the debate, he wasn't, he wasn't thinking. He just acted. He deliberately looked at the issue and said, Okay, I used to think I should only preach to the Jews. But God sent me to Cornelius. And in my mission to Cornelius, I saw even the Gentiles receiving the Holy Spirit and being saved. So because God saved Cornelius, I think he's telling us that God will save the whole world and not just the Jews. That's what he's trying to say here. But what did he do? He started thinking. So what did I, what did I just do? If you were to teach the lesson, I would look at this contrast. Okay? And review Mark 14 and how Peter boasted too much, prayed too little, acted too soon, thinking too little, too late. And at the back end, show everybody that he learned to be humble, he learned to be a pastor. He started praying, he had a prayer life, and he did not act too soon, he did not retaliate anymore. And he thought through things he had in church. All right? Now, I guess that's a that's a that's a get big bird's eye view of what how you'll teach the lesson. I think that's there's enough lessons for you to to glean from when you cover this. Um, but if you were to ask Peter, he wrote uh, First and Second Peter, the epistles, the epistles First and Second Peter, and of course people were saying that uh, the Gospel of Mark basically came from Peter. Because Mark was a good friend of Peter, and he told the story. And Mark wrote the gospel. Okay, here's the question. If there, were, if there are verses in First and Second Peter that will come to mind, give me some of those verses. I have two verses that I can come up with. Peter says, cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Okay? So, why was Peter saying that? Because... The church were being persecuted. They were dying for Jesus when he wrote the epistles. And Peter is saying, hey, regardless of the trouble that you have, cast everything that you have in Christ. Not because, does he, does he say, because you will deliver? No, because he cares for you. Let me share this with you. I, I was talking to this guy who came from Manila who had to attend the convention, the teacher's convention here. He, he attended one of the meetings we had in Manila three weeks ago when I was in Manila and you know how I preach the gospel I do not I do not preach doctrines based on doctrine alone I related to Jesus Christ and one night uh, the topic was the state of the dead you know what my passage was the passage was John 11 the raising of Lazarus uh, and what's the shortest verse in the Bible Jesus wept okay what's the context of that why did Jesus weep No, 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 no. <laughs> you want the math in there. Let's go to John. Why did Jesus weep? Yeah. Yeah, let me read the next verse. People say, see how he loved him. Um, I, I have to tell this story. Because um, if you go, just check out the Asidors. They're from Davao. They were the ones who sang with Justin during the series. And Andy, one of my favorite singers there, she, she's my powerhouse. She, that's the ad lib. Andy sang a song during the worship time before the meeting, the message. She, she sang the song, When I Cry, You Cry. You know how powerful that was? <laughs> After she sang that song, I started preaching on, I started preaching on John 11. <laughs> I asked everybody, why did Jesus weep? 
He knew Lazarus would be raised. He'll get to raise Lazarus. Because he loved him so much. So that when he cried, when we cry, he cries. You can see how powerful that was. With the song sang by Andy that says, when you cry, I cry. And then I was trying to communicate to these people, hey, when somebody dies in your family, if somebody gets hurt, Jesus is hurting with you. That was a very, very powerful message. That's why when Peter says, cast all your care upon him, for he cares for you. He's saying, even in the midst of death, in the midst of persecution, cast all your cares. It's not so much that you will be resurrected or you'll be spared the pain. You might even die, but it doesn't matter because even if you die, Jesus is there with you. He will never let you go. Be nice. And of course, there's another verse that's very helpful, particularly among us in this Advent movement. It says, God is not slow when it comes to His promises. Yeah. But He does not want anyone to perish. Okay? So that He wants everyone to come to repentance. That answers the fact that the biggest question we have as an Advent movement, we ask the question, Hey, my grandfather said Jesus will be coming back in his lifetime. My father said that, and now he hasn't come back. Um, there's a problem. Let, let me explain this to you. If you read the Old Testament, the Old Testament had the, had the formal books of the law, Genesis to Deuteronomy, then right? And they have 1st, 2nd Chronicles, 1st, 2nd Kings. These are former chronicles. And they had formal writings. They had written. These are formal books. 39 books in the prophets in the Old Testament. When you go to the New Testament, what do you find? The bulk of the New Testament are what? Are letters. They're not formal books. They're just letters. That's why they're short. They collected these letters and they made it part of the New. Why did they just write in letters in the New Testament? Because the church believed in their heart of hearts that Jesus will be coming back during their lifetime. Are you following? So there's no time to write books. What we need to do is just write letters of encouragement, encouragement with each other as we wait for Jesus to come back. Okay, what's the most important lesson that this is teaching right here? For Peter, it's not the date of the coming that really counts. As much as people coming to the fold and accepting the gospel of Jesus Christ. And because Peter had that kind of heart, he gives us a right perspective for the second coming of Jesus Christ as well. Right? So, uh, if you were to summarize this, if you're studying about Peter this coming weekend, as a Seventh-day Advent movement, how does Peter encourage us as an Advent movement? Well, Peter says, hey, as a movement, don't boast too much. Right? Learn to humble yourself. As a movement, pray some more. <laughs> don't depend on what you can do. And then, don't act too soon. Don't have a vengeful attitude. Be forgiving. Be gracious. Be loving to one another. What does it say? By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have loved love one for another. And then what else? Don't just act without thinking. Think some more. Oh, I'm going to take me into my soapbox again. That's why I really, like, I, I really dislike comments in church. Oh my, that's, that, that sermon is so doctrinal. It's so theological. What's the meaning of theology? The study of God. Okay, so why do we study God? Why do we study a subject? In order to know the subject. You study biology to know life sciences. And you study God to know God. Why is it important to know God? Because John 17, 3 says, And this is eternal life, that you might know God, a Father, uh, and then His Son, Jesus Christ. Question, can you know God without studying theology? No. That's why theology, by definition, is the knowledge of God. The problem is we, we start labeling things that we do in church, in in-depth Bible study, and say, it becomes a crutch. Basically, and if you a crutch, that's even a rationalization for me not to study the Bible properly. You got to study the Bible some more. By studying the Bible more, then you can be more equipped for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Here's the point. Is it possible to study the Bible without 
gaining anything from it. Yes, it is. It stays in your head. How do you gain anything from the Bible? What's the shortest distance between Bible study and a genuine Christian life? Somebody says it's 12 inches. What's the distance? 12 inches from here to here. Until it gets to your heart, your Bible study will be meaningless. Here's the point. If you don't study the Bible, you will not know what to follow in order to be more like Jesus Christ. Right? Only the Bible can tell you that. And if you study the Bible without following it, then it doesn't get here. It only stays here. It becomes useless. Now here's the question though. What if you don't study the Bible at all? You cannot go straight here. People try to go straight here without the Bible. And there's a very big problem. Because if you go straight here without the Bible, the enemy is going to mess up with you here. And you will have all sorts of heresies and problems in the church. So you've got to start with the Bible. What am I trying to say? You've got to start with the Word of God. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the preaching of Jesus Christ. And I think... Peter was saying that here, if you read Peter, the first part of Peter that says, Though you do not see him, you love him and rejoice with inexpressible joy. How were they able to love Jesus even if they haven't seen him? Peter was saying, I was there. I was in the transfiguration. I saw Jesus Christ. And you know what? It's interesting that we learned to love Jesus because we were with him for three years. But you, you haven't seen Jesus Christ. He already ascended to heaven. But you've learned to love him. Why did, how did they learn to love him? Because they had the word of God to tell them what God is all about. When I'm saying this, the only way for Jesus to be real to us today is to start the study of his word. Okay? But I want to go full circle back to the sermon I gave this morning. All of the Bible study that you have and all the activities that you have in church will be meaningless until they become acts of worship. What does that mean? Unless you consecrate them, not for yourself or not for the church, but only to God. Between you and God, it will really have no bearing at all. So, I mean, let me repeat this story for the sake of this lesson um, as we end. Um, Remember the story of Wrong Way Riggles? Wrong Way Riggles is a, is a football star. And I think it was Georgia and California playing for the NCAA championship. And before the first half ended, there was a, there was a skirmish. Okay? You know how they do it. They get the ball. There was a fumble. He fumbled the ball. And Roy Riggles was his name. This is my chance for startup. He grabs that football and he ran like crazy to the end zone. There was only one problem. He was going to the wrong goal. <laughs> right? So he ran and ran. You know, well, I'll be the hero. You know, I'll be the headlines tomorrow. And, you know, before he could hit the end zone, his own quarterback tackled him. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of the, the defensive tackle, tackle I think about four yards before the before that line. And of course, the half ended. They go into the lockers. Oh my! <laughs> Rigas covered his face with the towel. <laughs> he was, was sobbing in the corner, in the corner of the locker. I mean, they could have won the game early on, okay? But he was sobbing, sobbing. And then the coach says. All right, I want those who started the game to go back in the game. So, so, so everybody goes in there. Rigos was sitting there. He wasn't going anywhere with his towel. He said, hey, Rigos, what are you doing? So, go back in there. No, because I can't. Get, I, I'm an embarrassment to my school to my family to my friends i have no more face to show them i cannot go in there and then a coach said did you hear me <laughs> those who started the game you go in there start the second half and i sent wrong way riggles over there and according to the sportscaster nobody played football as hard as roy riggles during the second half in the history of the ncaa as a lesson to Peter, he made a very big boo-boo, probably with the worst sin anybody can commit 
a denial of Jesus Christ. But Jesus turned him around. And you can tell that there were very few people who ran the cause of Jesus Christ the way Peter did it. You know why? Because Jesus gave him a second chance. That's the main lesson of Peter. The main lesson of Peter, I think, is God is a God of second chances. And if you're willing for God to turn you around, you too can make an impact like Peter did for his kingdom. All right? Let's pray. If I thank you for this uh, short study we had, very colorful life Peter led uh, from his call as a disciple to the three years of ministry with Jesus, uh, the ups and downs of his personality, the shameful denial of our Lord before the crucifixion, and yet the good news of the second chance that Jesus gave him so that he can make a mark in the early church to make a difference for your kingdom. Oh Lord, may we learn, us here right now, having the lesson preview in our classes this coming week, when we do teach this lesson, that it's never too late. We can come back to God anytime, and He will give us a new lease on life, a second chance, so that we can go out there and play the hardest game in terms of Christian discipleship we can. Not for our own sake, but only for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.